Hey, my name is Milan and in this video I want to show you how you can use Cursor and AI for .NET development. For the past couple of weeks I've been tinkering around with Cursor, but I've mostly been using it for developing client-side applications using JavaScript or TypeScript. However, you can also use Cursor for .NET development, so let's jump into the code and I'm going to show you some examples. This is what the Cursor IDE looks like, and if it's familiar to VS Code, that's because this is literally a fork of VS Code with additional AI capabilities. Now, I'm going to show you what are some of the cool things that Cursor offers, and how it's different from existing developer tooling that uses artificial intelligence. Similar to how Copilot works, I can navigate into a new line of code, and I'm going to get a prediction of what is the next line of code that I want to write. Currently, Cursor doesn't have any context, so it doesn't know what to suggest, so I can click Ctrl K and give it some instructions, where I can even reference other elements in my code, and it's going to use that to generate some code. Now, there's also a chat capability using Ctrl L, and this opens up a chat window, and this is pretty similar to using ChatGPT, where you would write a prompt, and then Cursor is going to generate the code for you. However, I want to show you something that's very unique for Cursor, and that is the Composer capability. If I click Control i I'm going to get a window, which is the Composer window, and this allows me to write a detailed prompt that can manipulate multiple files at the same time. You can see that in the context of this Composer, I have the cancel meeting use case. So let's say I want to extend the functionality here to send some notifications to the participants after canceling the meeting. So let's write a prompt after canceling the meeting. We want to notify all the participants. So this is the high level prompt. Now let's make it more detailed so cursor knows what we want it to do. We should add a method in the I email service. So this is going to instruct it to make the change where it should be made, which is in this abstraction, and also implement it. And let's not actually give it context. I'm going to say implement it in the respective implementation class to see if it's able to figure it out. And this should probably be enough, but to be on the safe side, I'm going to say in the use case, after completing the EF core transaction, we're going to notify all the participants. So let's see if it's able to make sense of what I wanted to do and produce the code that's going to implement our use case. So now Cursor is going to generate the code that it thinks is going to achieve what I asked it to do. And if I go into the diff view, I can see what are the updates that will be made to the existing cancel meeting use case. And you will see that it's going to add a call to the new method on the email service. However, this isn't necessarily what I wanted to do. And moreover, it's modifying my use case away from using the primary constructor, which isn't what I wanted to do. On the email service side, the implementation is more or less correct. However, it's expecting that inside of this method, we're going to implement the email publishing logic. So let's update the prompt slightly to fix these mistakes. I'm going to say in the cancel meeting use case, we want to continue using the primary constructor for dependency injection. Also, we should loop through all the participants and send the email notification one at a time. So let's see if this is going to nudge cursor in the right direction. And this is already looking better. So now I have a method on the iEmail service that's called send meeting cancellation notification. And it accepts a user identifier and a meeting instance. So I'm going to click accept for this update and it should be applied in my code base. And then for the cancel meeting use case, it's just going to inject the iEmail service, which is perfect and then it's going to loop for the participants and send them an email. So let's click accept. I can close this. And if I go into my use case, you will see that the updates have been made accordingly. If I navigate to the I email service, you will also see the updates are made here as expected. The one downside with using cursor is that we can't really debug a .NET application. What I can do is use the terminal. For example, I can say .NET build and specify my solution file. And I should be able to build a project using the .NET CLI tooling, but this isn't nearly as powerful as using Visual Studio. Now you can see that that our build has succeeded. So our AI generated code is working as expected. For the past few weeks, my main takeaway of working with Cursor 
has been that the more quality of our prompt you give it, the better the results you get. Now, let's try something more complicated than refactoring an existing use case. I wanted to actually generate a completely new use case from scratch. So I'm going to open up a new composer window. Let's close this down and I'm going to open up the larger view. And what I wanted to do is to generate a new use case for me in the meetings folder and I'm going to give it the path to the respective folder. And this will be the use case for getting a meeting by the ID. For the general structure, you can use, and I'm going to give it an existing use case, the get user use case to see how this should be implemented. But let's also give it a few general notes. I'm going to give this as a listicle. So I'm going to say use primary constructors for dependency injection, use EF core link to write the query, expose a get endpoint like in the other use cases. And I'm going to say create the response types and nest them inside of the use case. So hopefully this is detailed enough for cursor to generate what we need. I'm going to hit enter and then cursor is going to take a moment to think about this and is going to generate our use case. So our use case is just a single file that contains the handle method that should implement the querying logic. And we also have a nested type inside that should represent our endpoint. So I'm going to minify this and we can take a look at the get meeting use case that was generated in just a few seconds. So you can see that it respected my request that I want to use primary constructors for dependency injection and it correctly injected the app DB context. So this is looking good. Then we have our meeting response, which is a complex type that has a participant response and an agenda item response. And these are collections inside of my meeting response DTO. Let's check out the handle method. And you can see we have our EF core query accessing the meetings database set on the database context, filtering by the meeting ID, which is an argument for the handle method. And then we have a projection to select back the meeting response this looks pretty okay to me and I'm pretty sure that this is a valid of core query and then we have single or default async and you can see that it's noticing that this is a meeting response which could be nullable so it's being explicit that the handle method can return a null value and then let's take a look at the endpoint it's implementing the i endpoint interface which is what I wanted and inside of it it's mapping a get endpoint for the meetings by the given ID and then it's injecting the use case executing it and based on the result, returning either results okay or results not found. Now, there are a few drawbacks, and this is again because I didn't give a detailed enough prompt. So let's see if it can fix this. I'm going to say we also have to register the get meeting use case with DI, which is short for dependency injection, in the program file. So I'm going to pass in the updated prompt, and I'm pretty confident that it will be able to figure out what I wanted to do. So let's take a look at the program file and you can see that it's adding just one line of code to add the get meeting use case as a scoped service. So I'm going to accept this change. We can navigate down, which is this line here. And I'm going to just delete the comment and leave everything as is. And a few prompts later, we have a completely valid use case. Now let's say that we aren't satisfied with the performance of our EF core query and I wanted to use Dapper. So I'm going to create a new composer to refactor the get meeting use case from EF core to Dapper. So let's try giving it a detailed prompt. We want to refactor the get meeting use case to use Dapper instead of EF core, which should give us improved performance. Now I'm going to give it a set of prompts as a list. So I'm going to say inject an MPG SQL data source because I'm using the Postgres provider for EF core. I already have a reference to this library. So I'm going to say inject this data source that we will use to open a database connection. Then I will say we will use this database connection to execute the SQL query. I'm also going to have it register an instance of a data source as a singleton. So I will say we also need to register the MPG SQL data source as a singleton in the program file. So I'm going to give this as additional context and I'm going to tell it to pay special attention to how it's mapping the participants and agenda items collections on the meeting response because this is a bit tricky with Dapper. So I'm wondering if it will be able to figure this out. So I'm going to say be careful about mapping 
the response from SQL into an object because we are returning two collections together with the meeting, the participants and agenda items. And these have to be manually mapped when using Dapper. So I think this should be enough for cursor to produce what I want it to. So I'm going to hit enter and then we're going to wait a few moments for cursor to think about our requirement. After a few moments, I have my code and here is the service registration for the MPG SQL data source is grabbing my connection string, creating one instance and adding that as a singleton, which is excellent. This is how it should be used. So I'm going to say accept. We can also make this smaller to go into the code and observe the change that was just made. So this is the code here. Now, if I go back to the get meeting use case, let's take a look at what we have here. So first of all, it's injecting the data source without respecting my previous prompt of using primary constructors. Now, this is something that you can fix by customizing your cursor settings. And there is a section here called rules for AI, where you can give some general instructions into how you want it to write code. You can also give it some additional context. For example, you can tell cursor that it's a .NET senior software engineer and it should write code like so and so. I didn't explore this feature too much, but it's definitely something that's on my list. Now, if I go back to my use case, let's say I want to accept this without changing anything for the time being, because I can easily refactor this myself. What I'm interested in is the use case. So you can see that it's using the data source to open a connection. Now it's using the async method, but it's not using a wait using here, which you should be able to do because this is an iAsync disposable. Now let's omit this for the moment. So it's using the connection to execute the query below. And here is the query. So I can go ahead and validate that this is the correct query. So you can see it's selecting the columns from the meetings table here. And then it's doing a left join to the participants and agenda items. And what I like is that it split the columns for the participants and the agenda items into separate rows in this query, which is pretty good. If we carry on, we can see that it's creating a meeting dictionary, which is going to use to store the meeting response. And then the actual query selects a meeting response, the participant response, and the agenda item response. So this is how you can project multiple types from a single Dapper query. And the end result will always be a meeting response. We're going to provide our SQL query and then a function that's going to allow us to map an individual row into the result type, which is the meeting response. So you can see that it's checking if we already have an entry for this meeting ID. If we don't have it, you can see that it's doing something interesting. This is the width expression, and it's using the fact that this is a record to create a copy of the meeting and assign an empty list to the participants and agenda items. And then it's going to add this meeting entry into the dictionary. And here it's using casting to cast this from an enumerable into a list because it knows that the underlying type is a list to be able to call the add method and add the participant or the agenda item. And finally, it's going to return the meeting entry. This does look like it would work. Now I'm a bit concerned with the agenda title here. And this is part of this query here that's projecting the title and the duration of the agenda item so that these values are different from the meeting title and duration. Now, why I'm concerned is I'm not sure that it will be able to map this to the agenda item response record. Of course, this is something that you will have to validate when you actually run the code. At the end of our use case, it's just going to say meeting dictionary values single or default. And this is the correct method to call because there should only be one value inside of the dictionary. So I'm going to say accept. I'm pretty happy with this. And then I can go ahead and start my application and validate if this is working as expected. But you can see that this does save me a lot of time having to write the SQL query myself, writing the code for the dapper mapping, which is already cumbersome with just a one to many projection. But here we have two one to many projections for the participant and the agenda item. So you can see that cursor is able to generate a pretty decent EF core query as well as a Dapper query. So depending on how you are writing your application queries, you can use cursor pretty efficiently. Now, I also want to show you a pretty cool feature. And what I'm going to do is scaffold a new folder, for example, for the room entity that I currently do not have. And I'm going to ask cursor to generate a rooms folder, create the respective use cases inside of this folder, as well as the entity, as well as the EF core mapping and all of the additional updates that need to happen. Now I'm going to spend a moment to write a more detailed prompt. And then we're going to discuss what I'm asking cursor to do. So here's the prompt that I came up with. 
we want to add a new entity to our application, a room, and this entity should live in the rooms folder and follow the same design and structure as the users folder and the meetings folder. We will need a room class to represent the entity with the needed properties. I could have specified what are the properties, but I'm going to let the AI decide. Update the EF core context to expose a database set for this entity. Create use cases for creating, updating, removing, and getting a room. Each use case should follow these rules. We want to use primary constructors for dependency injection. We want to inject the database context and use link for communicating with the database. We want to register the use case with dependency injection in the program file. We want to create a respective endpoint class that implements iEndpoint and nest it inside of the use case. And we also want to expose the correct endpoint on the API. We want to tag the endpoints, similar to how it's done for the users and meetings endpoints. And we want to create the request and response types for the use case as nested types in the use case. So now I'm going to hit enter and you can watch how cursor is doing the work behind the scenes generating the room entity, updating my database context, and then it's going to proceed to create my use cases. So we have a create room, update room, remove room, and get room use case. Then it has a room endpoints type, and it's going to update the program CS file. So I'm going to minify the compose window, and we can observe the new files one by one. So we have our room entity, which you can see here, with an identifier, a name, a capacity, what should be the number of people that can be inside, and the location, and if it has video conferencing. So let's say that this is enough for a room entity. Now let's see what we have in the program file. So it's going to register my use cases as scope services, which is what I want, but it's also mapping my individual endpoints, which isn't what I want. So I'm going to just add a call to map endpoints and remove this. Moreover, I can even move these calls up here where the other use cases are. And let's say I'm happy with the program file. Then I can take a look at the get room use case and you can see that it's respecting my request. So it's injecting the database context using the primary constructor. We have a response type containing the properties of the room and it's using EF core to send the link query and return this from the handle method. Then we have an endpoint with the correct route, accepting an ID from the route and injecting the use case. Then it's going to use this to get a room response and return a response. It's also tagging my endpoint, which is what I wanted it to do. So this is pretty good. Then there's the room endpoints, which just contains a constant so that I can tag my individual endpoints. In the remove room use case, we're fetching this from the database context, removing it, calling save, pretty standard for a CRUD use case. And then we have an endpoint to expose this. We have the same in the update room, except we also have a request object that we can send to the handle method. But you can see that it's updating my room entity. And it also has a resource check in the endpoint to verify that the ID on the route and the one on the request object are the same value. So this is pretty cool. In the create room use case, pretty standard, just some CRUD in the handle method, and then exposing a post endpoint for creating a new room. Now, what's interesting is that it's returning a created response, which is going to generate a location header, and I definitely like this. So I'm going to say accept all, and in a matter of moments, we generated an entity, one, two, three, four use cases, together with minimal API endpoints and the use case logic completely from scratch, and we also registered it all with dependency injection. And now I can proceed to ask Cursor to write some unit tests or even integration tests for my use cases so that I can verify the behavior or I can go into Visual Studio, start this myself and just debug the new endpoints and verify that they are working as expected. But I'm completely blown away with how fast you can generate a basic structure for a new endpoint, get a few working use cases and then start customizing this if you need to implement additional requirements. I think that this is going to unlock some insane productivity improvements for .NET developers. And it would be really awesome if we had something like this directly integrated into Visual Studio or even JetBrains Writer. That would probably be the one feature that would make me switch to using Writer. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to click the like button for the YouTube algorithm and let me know in the comments if you want to see more videos about Cursor. If you want to see another interesting example of using Cursor, then you should watch this video next. Check out my clean architecture and modular monolith courses to improve your software architecture skills. And until next time, stay awesome.